Drinkers, we are a Christian recovery program. We focus on the road to recovery using the 12 steps. We use various recovery materials, including the Bible, a big book, and a basic text, celebrate recovery, and other relevant sources. We want to make it very clear this is not an AA or NA meeting. We're not affiliated with either fellowship. With many of us being members of these fellowships ourselves, we have a great respect for their traditions. We endorse them. They do not endorse us. Um, the Chain Breakers experience allows you to be changed, transformed, and renewed by God working in your life. As you work and study the 12 steps, you will step into the future that God has planned for each one of you. God has a good plan for your life. We believe that through the 12 steps and the power of Jesus Christ that we can be chain breakers. If you're not a Christian, please know you are wanted and welcome here. We will pass the basket for donations to help pay for weekly expenses, including free literature and Bibles we give to patients when bringing our meeting into treatment centers for each and I. If you're watching online and you would like to donate, let's give it up for our online audience. They're so faithful. <laughs> Only God can bring people together from not just across the United States. We have people that watch from Scotland and all over the place. Only God can put his hand in something like that where he can just unite his kids from all over the world. So it's really exciting and, and so we're grateful for our online um, audience. Um, let's see here. Welcome everyone who is watching online. Please feel free to put it in the chat where you are watching from and if you're new so we can welcome you. Also, please hit that like or follow button so you can get notified when we have our meetings and hit the share button if you feel comfortable to do so to help us share recovery in the gospel. Um, we are also on YouTube if you want to like and subscribe. We encourage sponsorship. A sponsor is someone who will take you through the 12 steps. We also encourage you to get a list of phone numbers to help you build a support network. If anyone would like a list of phone numbers, would you please raise your hand? You want any numbers? Pete? Uh, Jojo, can you do a mail list? Pete? Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any newcomers or visitors to the group for the first time that would like to introduce themselves? Salter, welcome! after the meeting. Um, there's, a hand, there's a connection card on the meeting there if you want to hand that in. What that does is we take all those prayer meetings. We have a prayer warriors group. It's just a few select people that are confidential and uh, we actually do a prayer meeting and we pray over these um, uh, daily so we can pray for you by name handing that in. Um, we know that God hears and answers prayer here. Um, and also we would love to give you a free gift for joining us tonight. Um, if you're willing and able to be a sponsor, please raise your hands and keep them up for a moment. All right. If you need a sponsor, feel free to see me um, at the front of the meeting uh, uh, up here. I'll be happy to get you connected with somebody if you need a sponsor. Any newcomers or visitors, if you would like someone to reach out to you, as we understand how hard it is to pick up that 1,000-pound phone, simply fill out the top portion of the cards on the table, and someone will reach out and get in touch with you. It's not a necessity. Please hear that. It's not a necessity. This is just an option if you would like it. So if you know you're someone who struggles with being able to pick up that phone and reach out, um, you could take that contrary action, fill out one of those cards. Um, you know, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the chapter Working with Others, it actually di directs that the recovered person is supposed to be the one reaching out to the newcomer, not the other way around. So we will be happy to uh, break that ice for you um, if you would like us to. Also at the bottom of that, uh, the card on the table is that prayer request section. So if you have any prayer requests, you can fill it out and just put it in the basket as it goes around, and we will be praying for you throughout the week. Listen, you don't even have to put your name on it if you don't want to. We may not know who we're praying for, but God does, and we know that God hears and answers prayer here. All right, lastly, if you want to get involved, the commitment sign-up sheet is at that uh, back table. It used to be the front table, now it's the back table. i got to change up. With Miss Renee. Can we give it up for Miss Renee volunteering back there? Yay! Looking lovely girl as Eva. Okay. Um, you can see her. The commitment sign-up sheet is back there. Um, and if you want to uh, make Chain Breakers your spiritual home group, you can sign up there. Uh, many of our members have an AA or an NA home group and then also um, uh, make this their spiritual home group as well. Um, okay, let's see here. Also, we have our home group meeting. We meet on the first uh, Wednesday of the month at 6.30. So that is going to be next week at 6.30. So um, if you didn't sign up and you feel like you want to make Chain Breakers your home group, just come on in. We'd love to have you. Um, 
All right, let's see here. Would all home group members please raise your hand? Thank you for your service. All right. So uh, my name is Angelina. I am a recovered, delivered, and redeemed addict and alcoholic. So our normal for, we have some newcomers uh, here tonight. Our normal format is we do um, a 12-step study normally from either the uh, AA Big Book or the NA Basic Text. And we'll have two 12-step speakers on that. And then um, we'll open up the meeting for share. Um, but I'm very excited tonight. Um, my friend and church congregant, we have a guest uh, speaker tonight, um, Big Al, and he's going to share his story with us. Um, I won't give you, uh, I'll let him share all the good details, but I'm really, really excited. So um, would everyone please give me a great big chain breaker welcome to Al. <laughs> Anybody remember the song? Yeah. All right. Anybody uh, can relate to that song? You know where it's from? The Harlem Globetrotters. All right, we're going to get that, into that for a second, but I just picked up this uh, uh, Daily Bread out there. And you know what the first sentence uh, for tonight says? Home for the future. It says... Are you surrounded by people whose mission is to inject a dose of reality into your life? Huh. Isn't that what this is all about? Mm -hmm. Reality? Um, my name is Al Zolak. They call me Big Al. Um, I am a recovered addict. Um, if you have any questions about what I say here tonight, please feel free to ask me. Uh, my life has been an open book. I've done all types of TV work. Uh, I did the Howard Stern show. I've done... Uh, uh, gosh, uh, CBS did a special on me, um, all different types of things. I uh, traveled around the world with the Harlem Globetrotters where I was on the opposition team called the Washington Generals. Um, I'm the founder of a program that I created called Do Hugs Not Drugs. Um, I was a substance awareness coordinator counselor in the high school for 20 years. And then they moved me to the health and phys ed department because they wouldn't break the law for the superintendent. Well, see, excuse me for having values and morals, okay? So, I mean, that's, uh, maybe that's hard to find today. I was a club advisor for 20-some years for the Bible Club at uh, Hamilton High School. Um, I traveled around the country speaking in schools, uh, churches, prisons, trying to uh, help save and change people's lives. Um, I know sometimes at recovery meetings, people are impressed by how much time you have clean. So I figured it out about five minutes ago. I have officially 37 years, five months, and 21 days. Okay? <laughs> Well, what does that mean? See, when I go to the diner, I gotta pay two fifty for my coffee too, right? And so do we all. So basically, what we have, we have today, and that is it. You see, what I have learned is I learn from my past. I live for today, and I prepare myself for my future. You keep on doing what you've always done. You're always going to get what you always got. Okay, little sayings like that. You know, uh, uh, stay with me and. Um, as I said, I, I used to travel around the world with the Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, I was an all-American kid growing up. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, and I didn't do drugs. All through high school, all through college, and even all through my professional basketball career. But something happened to me when I was 27 years old. That's going to happen to each and every one of us sitting in here right now, if it hasn't happened already. You see, I used to, after my basketball career, I used to work in a place called Wildwood, New Jersey. As a non-drinking bouncer bartender. And then, that was during the summer. During the winter, I would go down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and work as the same. Well, this one winter when I was 27 years old, I was living in Florida, and I received a telephone call. Now, this telephone call changed my whole life as it is today. Picked up the telephone, and the person on the other end of the line said to me, your mother's dead. You see, when I got this phone call, I felt these feelings, I felt these emotions, and I felt this pain. That I've never felt before in my life. I had to come up to New Jersey, Woodbury, as a matter of fact, and go to the viewing of my best friend, my mother. After her funeral, there was something different in my life. Because I went back down to Florida with these feelings, with these emotions, with this pain, with this emptiness in my heart, knots in my stomach, all because I lost my best friend, my mother. When I went back down to Florida this time, I went over to one of my so-called friend's houses. 
My friend said, here, big Al, try some of this. This will help ease the pain that you're going through. Help you escape reality for about a week or two. And this is where I made the biggest mistake that I ever made in my life. And I said that word, yes. And that was just something called cocaine. Now my friend told me it was going to help me for about a week or two. <laughs> my friend lied. Because my two-week escape turned into seven years of living hell. Seven years where I started off free because it was given to me by a so-called friend. Mm -hmm. Then I realized you had to buy it. Then I realized how expensive it was. Then I myself turned into a big-time drug dealer. Where my own personal habit grew from being free. To up to $1,000 a day at times. $1,000 a day. Needless to say, I'm lucky to be alive. Or better yet, I like to say somebody up there must really love me. You see, the cocaine destroyed my life. It raped me of everything I had physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. It destroyed my life. It took everything from me except for my life. And the funny part about that is I don't know when or if it will do that. Because I can't see the inside of my body. We can't see inside of our bodies to see the damage that we've done. It all started out for me at that party on Friday and Saturday nights. Like maybe it started out for some of you. My Friday turned into Saturday, my Saturday turned into Sunday, my Sunday turned into Monday, and before I knew it, I was only drinking and drugging on days that started with letter T. Tuesday and Thursday, I wish, because it became today and tomorrow. I lived to use, and I used to live, I was drinking and drugging every day. I used to live in a house where all my shades pulled down, even during the daytimes, because I would be constantly peeking out of my windows because I thought there was somebody out there chasing me. <laughs> Yeah, there was nobody out there chasing me, of course. But these were the beginning stages of the paranoia that was setting into my life. I wouldn't fall asleep at nights I'd pass out. I wouldn't wake up in the morning and I would come to. If I had to brush my teeth, I had to do a line of cocaine just to get the energy to get out of my bedroom to get, them, get to my bathroom to brush my teeth. You see, I was sick. I didn't care about you. But more important, I didn't care about myself. Because I loved getting high and I loved getting drunk. During my last two years of my seven-year addiction, the drugs paralyzed me for a month and a half, and I couldn't walk. You would think that that would straighten me out. You see, it did for a month and a half because I couldn't get out of my house to get my drugs, and none of my so-called friends were delivering. My so-called friends. Where were they when I was paralyzed for a month and a half? They were over somebody else's house mooching for free. They didn't care if I lived or died. We have some people calling me my boys, my girls, whatever you want to call these people. You see, I used to have a lot of money, I used to have a lot of drugs, and I used to have a lot of friends. There came a time near, near, near the end of my seven-year addiction that I ran out of money, I ran out of drugs, and again, guess who else ran out of me? My so-called friends. When I ran out of money, drugs, and friends, I was about ready to be tossed out to the gutter with no place to live, nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep. And that's, that's when I said, God bless you. That's when I said to myself, I better get a job. You see, when I was drinking and drugging, I couldn't hold a job because at 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning when everybody else was getting up to their work, I was still trying to fall asleep because I was drunk or high all night. But a funny thing happened to me since I stopped drinking and drugging. I was able to actually get a job and hold on to it for once, which enabled me to have a roof over my head, food in my mouth, clothes on my back. And things started going better for me since I stopped drinking and drugging. I even met this young lady one day and I got engaged. Now since all these wonderful things were happening to me, I came up with this brilliant idea. I said, Alan, you can go back out with your drugs again just on Fridays and Saturdays for fun. So I started going out with my drugs again on Fridays and Saturday nights instead of going out with my fiance. Until one day, I walked into my apartment and this young lady was sitting on my sofa crying her eyes out like a baby with my ring in her hand. When I walked into the apartment that day, she said, here, pal, here's your ring back. Get out of my life. She said, I'm sick and tired of watching you destroy yourself. I'm sick and tired of watching you kill yourself, and I'm not going to let you destroy and kill me. You see, when this young lady threw me out of her life that day, I finally realized something. I finally realized that me, this big damn macho guy that I thought I was, that I had a problem. Three days after she threw me out of her life, I had to do the toughest thing that I ever had to do as a man, and that is this. I went over to an older woman's house crying like a baby. 
And I said to this lady, I said, I've got a drug problem. You see, this lady didn't give me a big lecture. This lady didn't scream and yell at me or nothing like that. She said to me, she said, that's okay. She reached out. She gave me a hug and took me for help. That's why my program's called Do Hugs, Not Drugs. Not because it's cute. It's because something so simple as some love, something so simple as a hug, saved my life at that time. She took me for help. And the rest is history. Where did she take me? 12-step meetings. I started to go to these meetings. I saw everybody getting up and drinking coffee. I said, let me try some coffee. I didn't like it after I tried it because it made me feel like I was doing coke. I felt like speed racer after I drank one cup of coffee. So I just sat there. But I listened and I learned. For 30 days. You know, it was, it was so tough. My favorite slogan was one day at a time. You know, there were times I'd be driving down the road and I know if I make a left-hand turn, I could go cop. And I would drive home as quick as possible, pick up that thousand-pound phone that Angelina was just talking about, and call somebody. You see, they said, get phone numbers. See, I would dial that phone. Nobody was answering, but I keep on dialing. But just by dialing that phone, it took my mind off of the thought of using. And that's how I made it. But after my first 30 days of being clean... I say to myself, wow, I feel so good. I can control it now. <laughs> yeah. So I went out and bought an eighth of Coke, okay? Went, went, went in, into my bathroom, chopped out my first line, did a line. All of a sudden, all that pain, all that misery came right back upon me, just like fat. I took that eighth of Coke, walked it over to the toilet, and flushed it down the toilet. $250 worth, and I said, you know what, I'd rather flush this down the toilet than my life. And I went to a meeting that night for the first time in my life for me. You see, I went the first 30 days because I wanted to get my girlfriend back. You know, I was doing it for her. You know, trying to get her back and all this other kind of neat stuff. But I did it for me. That was July 6th, 1986. And I haven't touched a drink, drug, nothing ever since then. You see, when I went to the meetings, you know, I never hugged any of the girls because I knew exactly where my mom would go. I got serious. Some people didn't like me at meetings because when I spoke, I spoke the truth. You know, when people come back, they hug them, oh, welcome back, and all this other kind of crap. All up. You know something? It's not a matter of when you get back. It's a matter of if you make it back. Because I've been to plenty of funerals of guys that went out for that one more run, one more time, one more this and one more that. You see, it's not a joke and it's not a game. I took my recovery very, very serious. And I said to myself, you know, I want to go to these meetings for the rest of my life. You know? So I paid attention. Well, I, I used to take a, a guy to give him a ride to meetings, and the only thing he would talk about is how he used to get high. And I stopped my car and I said, Sir, listen, you got a wife and kids. Can't you talk about them? If you want to ride with me, you know, don't be talking about that stuff anymore. Next four days, he wrote me, didn't say a word. You know, realize what we have in life. Realize what we have in life. Because I know if I got what I deserve, I wouldn't be standing up here tonight, I'd be dead. I would be dead if I got what I deserve or I would have been locked up for 30 or 40 years. You know, I, I consider myself a recovered person. This is my story. This is what, what I feel. Because when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into my, uh, into my life as my Lord and Savior on January 29th, 1989... Pastor Bruce, when I was coming here to church, gave me something. He said, Al, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 in the Bible. You are a new creation. Out with the old, in with the new. And I trust in God. I believe in I believe in God. How did I accept the Lord? Here's a funny story. After my girlfriend had thrown me out of her life, I lived in an apartment complex in Blackwood, New Jersey. And I went to the pool one day. And as I went to the pool, I saw these two hot chicks, man. 
So I'm sorry. I, I just got, I got to explain it like it is, okay? These, these, <coughs> these two uh, beautiful young ladies. <laughs> and I said, uh, I walked in and uh, they were reading something, sitting on their blankets. I, I walked over to them and I said, hey, can I sit with you? They said, sure. I said, I'm in, Daddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I sat down and said, what you, what, you, what you reading, girls? They said, the Bible. <laughs> I said, what? See, I don't want to hear that stuff. So I sat there for a couple hours and I suffered. Okay? Be honest. I just suffered. Oh, I'm read and all. I didn't want to hear that. Every time I would see these two girls walking towards me, they would invite me to their church. It got to the point when I saw these two girls walking in my direction, I'd go, and I would go in the opposite direction. Until January 29th, 1989, I woke up one Sunday morning and I looked out my window. It was beautiful. It was sunny and everything. I said, you know what? I'm going to go check out that church. It was uh, Living Waters, which was on Delcy Drive in Kirkville. Not too far from here. And they had a guest speaker. His name was Jeff Fenholt, who had a cup of coffee with Black Sabbath. He was a singer. And you know Black Sabbath and all. I mean, if you're old rock and rollers. And he was talking about his $12,000 a month apartment up in New York and his drug addiction and everything. At the end, when he was done speaking, he had what we called an altar call. Now, the place was packed. I'm standing in the back of the church. And as he's doing this altar call, I feel something tugging at my heart. Didn't know what it was at the time. Felt that little tug, and I started looking around saying, what are these people going to think if I walk up front and do this? You know, it's... After a couple minutes, that tug kept on happening, and I said to myself, you know what? I don't care what these people think. I need this Jesus. I went up in front of the church, broke down crying, accepted the Lord uh, Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Lord, personal Savior, and my life has never been the same. Now, i got to tell you, no lightning bolts came down, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'll tell you what I felt for the first time in my life. is something called inner peace. Yeah. Inner peace, which I never felt like this before. Okay. Now, Jeff helped me go to uh, Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona for Athletes International Ministries, where I met all these professional football players, professional basketball players, professional people, Metal Arch Lemon, who I used to travel around the world with as a preacher, you know. He helped me out getting down there and growing in the Lord. I consider myself a rookie. I'm still learning every day. I have a brother-in-law that can recite the Bible to you who's been just in five rehabs. He just graduated from another one in Florida. And I said to him, I said, Art, let me tell you something. All this Bible knowledge that you have isn't doing you one bit of good until you apply it to your life. Yeah. It's wasted knowledge. So we just got him into the rehab. He's been in there for a year, just graduated a, about a month ago. Yeah. You see, January 29th, 1989, that November, I got married. Yes, somebody thought it was cute. Isn't that amazing? I married the same girl who threw me out of her life. It took me three years to get her back, but I had to get myself back. And I'm working on myself every day. My wife got pregnant. Nobody ever told me that doing drugs can affect your future kids. On August the 7th at 6.49 that year, my wife and I had a beautiful baby girl at the Underwood Hospital in Woodbury. I went home from the hospital that morning to get some sleep. Before my head hit the pillow, my telephone rang again. It was my wife on the other end of the line screaming and crying that there's something wrong with our baby. There's something wrong with our baby. When I hung up the phone that morning, <clears throat> I start to cry my heart out. As I'm walking away from that phone, I stopped. And I looked up. I said, aha, you're testing me. I said, dear Lord, I trust in you. Your will will be done. And I walked away from that phone laughing. If somebody would have seen me, they would have thought that I was crazy. Our daughter was born with something called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Crib death, whatever you want to call it. She had me hooked up to a monitor for the first eight weeks. 
the buzzer on that monitor went off about seven or eight times a night. What you got to do when that buzzer goes off, you got to run to the crib. And you don't know if you're going to find a breathing baby or a not breathing baby. Painful and not fun. Seven years later, on December 19th, my wife and I had another baby girl. On December 29th, when she was 10 days old, me and my wife were watching TV about 1.30 in the morning, and our little baby was in a bassinet next to us. I looked down and I saw some milk coming out of her mouth. I went out to the kitchen, got a towel, came in, wiped the milk off, and the next thing I noticed was she was turning purple. My wife got up and ran to the phone, dialing 911, hurry, hurry, please get here. I picked up her little daughter out of that little bassinet, and as I did, stuff started coming out of her nose and her mouth. She was limp in my hands, turning purple, dying in my hands. What did I do? I held her up to the Lord, and I said, please God, if you need someone, take me, not her, because she was dying in my hands. You see, no matter where we are in life, things are going to happen. When we're in recovery, things are going to happen. When that shoe drops, what are you going to do when that shoe drops? You see, when my mother died, I turned to drugs. When both my daughters almost died at birth, I turned to our Lord and Savior. See, today, I'm not afraid to die. I'm 73 years old. I'm closer to the end than I am to the beginning. And I, and I know this and I realize that. You see, how it works, if you've been to all these different programs, you know that what those letters stand for. H-O-W, honesty, open-mindedness, open and willingness. I used to do a lot of counseling. And people would talk to me and I would say, you know something, I'm going to believe everything you tell me. See, after I get done talking to you, I go home to my wife and kids. Okay? What I want you to do is, you know, when you go home, look in that mirror and say the same story to that person because that's who you're lying to and that's who you're cheating. Yeah. It's not a game. It's not a joke. You know? I stand up here before you with extensive heart disease. 20 some years ago, they found five blockages in my arteries going to my heart. Two of my arteries was 95% closed, which means only a pinhole of blood was getting through. I got three stents inside me keeping me alive. How God sends people into our lives just as we need them. I had a heart catheterization. And you can't move because you're drugged up and I'm looking at the doctors doing it. And I look at the one doctor, look at the other doctor and go, I knew something was up. I go into the recovery room and the doctor tells me, we found five blockages, we don't know what we can do for you. Let me can talk to some other doctors and we'll see. So I'm laying there and thinking my life's over and this orderly comes in. He says, I gotta move, remove this tube from your leg and put pressure on your groin so you don't bleed to death. Is that okay? I said, yeah, I guess so. He said, how do things go? And I said, uh, not too good. He looks down to me and says, do you know the Lord? Can I pray for you? I start to break, I just broke down right then there crying. God sent somebody into my life just when I needed him. And he does that with each and every one of us, but sometimes we're not paying attention. We're not paying attention. And this is what we got to do. You have to surrender. Let me touch on marijuana for a second. Do you know marijuana is directly related to psychosis, schizophrenia, depression, suicidality, addiction? Suicide. I want to talk about suicide for a second because we just had four suicides in Mullica Hill, New Jersey, right where I live. Last year, 18-year-old kid jumped off the Commodore Barry Bridge. They found his body three months later. A couple months ago, a 21-year-old kid jumped off the Delaware Memorial Bridge from Mulligale. 
A 32-year-old guy on April 27th jumped off the Commodore Barry Bridge. And then six houses down from me on April 27th, they found an 18-year-old kid hanging in his basement. What is suicide? Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Okay? A permanent solution to a temporary problem. Who makes us feel like hurting ourselves? It's other people. How do other people treat us? What do other people do to us? What do other people say about us? Makes us sometimes feel like we don't want to live. Do you know how to get even with those other people that make you feel that way? You live. You let them know you're going to be around as long as possible to really make their lives miserable. <laughs> you don't hurt yourselves. And I talked to quite a few people that wanted to die. You see, when you commit suicide, your pain does not end there. Okay? Even though some people think it, it does. What you're doing is you're transferring that pain to your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, the people who love you, your closest friends, everyone who knows you and loves you. And they're going to have to carry that for the rest of their lives. Carry that pain. So what you're doing is you're transferring pain. There is nothing that is worth harming yourself over. You see, no matter what we're going through, God is our comforter. He comforts us through his presence. It is God's nature to be with us and to give us comfort when we are mourning Brokenhearted, overwhelmed, worried, or sick. But we must acknowledge his presence and accept his comfort. He comes to us through his word, the Bible. He comes to us through our prayers. He comes to us through our godly friends. Today, look for those who provide comfort. And let's practice comforting others. The distance between heaven and hell is 12 inches. That's the distance between your mouth and your heart. It says in Romans 9, Confess by thy mouth and believe in thy heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you will be saved. You will be saved. Early in my recovery, somebody said to me, he says, Al, it's better to pray to God and find out that there isn't one than not to pray and find out that there is. What a gift. Eternal life and it's free. What is that? Something knocking. That's called opportunity. Opportunity is knocking. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what problems you've gone through. Some people say, well, if he only knew what I was going through, he wouldn't be able to talk. You know, you know, listen, pain is pain. The worst stories that we know is our own stories. People have hurt you. But I want to tell you that God loves the people that hurt you just as much as he loves you. Amen. Let me ask you a question. If I told you that I was going to give you a dollar for every kind word you said and then take away a dollar for every unkind word you said, would you be rich or would you be poor? You know? I'm an encourager. That's what I am. I mean, I spoke in a sixth grade last year where a kid came up to me during my counseling session after I spoke, he said, Big Al, you've changed my life today. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I will never try to hurt myself again because of you. I said, well, what do you mean? In December, I tried to hurt myself. I said, who knows about it? He says, my mother, my father. I go to therapy once a week now. But I will never do it again because of you. I have letters that would rip your heart out. Thank you, you were, you were one in a thousand. I was seriously considering committing suicide. My plan was to skip school, wait until somebody pulled into my driveway and then shoot myself. I once tried to kill myself because my father was very sick. I will never try to kill myself again because of you. 
over and over and over again. I had a fourth grade girl came up to me after my assembly. She said, Big Al, every night I go home, my mother, father, sisters, and brothers are drunk or high. It's a very, very lonely place for me to be. The only thing I want is someone to tell me that they love me. Someone to tell me that they care. Is that too much for a fourth grader to ask for? Someone to love them? When was the last time you told someone that you love them? For those of you that are here, whoever you live with, maybe your wife, your boyfriend, your girl, whatever, you go home tonight and give them a hug. The first words out of their mouth is going to be, what do you want? <laughs> what you do wrong, if you're married, they'll go out and look at the car and say, okay, that's okay. What's wrong with saying I love you? The last three words I said to my mother was on the telephone. I said, Mom, I love you. She said, I love you. And then the next phone call I got, she was dead. What I'd like to do right now is give each and every one of you an opportunity. If you have accepted the Lord before, and maybe you're backsliding a little bit. See, the first time I accepted the Lord, I did it for 13 straight weeks. Because I said to myself, I, I never get anything right. I want to make sure I get this right. And I'd like to give you a chance to accept Him. If everybody could just bow your head for a couple seconds and repeat after me in your, in your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for my sins past, present, and future. I now ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. In your precious name I pray. Amen. If any of you did that, you can either come up to me afterwards, and I see Angelina afterwards, or, or one of the members here. You see, I'm not a pastor or nothing like that. But I gotta tell you, one of the most amazing things in my life happened last year. Me and my wife were in Naples, Florida. We have a condo down there, and we were at the swimming pool. And uh, there's only about four or five people at the pool that day. And we're sitting down, and I says to my wife, the <clears throat> guy in the pool keeps on staring at me. I said, really? He just keeps on staring at me. So anyhow, we sit down. This guy in the water comes walking over. He says, uh, you're that basketball dude that played with the Harlem Globetrotters, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. I said, did I speak with you last year? Because we only go down there once in a while. Then he looks back down at the water. He looks up at me. He says, uh, you're a Christian, right? I said, yes, sir. He looks down, looks back up. He says, uh, would you please pray for me? I said, sure. I get up, I go, jump into the pool. He was telling me that he has to go for a colonoscopy where his last one wasn't clear, and he's worried. I prayed with him in the pool. After I got done praying, the guy says to me, he says, uh, would you please baptize me? I never did this before, but I've been to enough of them. And I baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We get out of the pool, and I'm sitting with my wife. I said, I got to go down and talk to this guy because it, he seemed like he was like a little bit suicidal. And I went down and I said, Sir, I just want to thank you. And he looks at me weird. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank you for what you did for me today. How good you made me feel by asking me to pray for you and baptize you. Words cannot explain how great you made me feel. Thank you for that. And he was fine. I walked away and I sat down with my wife. The guy gets up and gets stressed and he yells down to me, you planted the seed last year. And I just said, sometimes it takes a little bit of time or some ordering to make it grow. You see, it's not just up to the pastor to lead people to the Lord. If you're a Christian, invite people to church. Because you know what? When I die, I want to see you there. I want to see you there. And when we have loved ones that aren't Christians or, 
or uh, aren't saved, we should invite them to church, hoping that they will get saved because you love them and care about them so much that you want to see them again. It's up to each and every one of us. We are a gift right now. And I know some of you sitting here know what I'm talking about when I say we're lucky to be here. First of all, for this great program, Chain Breakers, people that love you and care about you. We got to start loving ourselves and caring about ourselves and making the right decisions because there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help you. And the only thing you have to do is ask. And just because I'm a Christian and I go to church, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to have problems. Things are going to happen in my family. Things are going to happen all the time. You know? But today, the difference is, when my mom died, like I said, I turned to drugs. Today, I turn it over to my Lord and Savior. And I trust in Him with all my heart and all my soul. I just want to thank you for listening to me tonight. Each and every one of you are a, a true breath, blessing. And if you haven't heard these words in a long time, I just want to say to you, I love you. I, I don't have to know you to love you. And I care about you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you very much. Oh, we got to turn off the